Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast. I'm Doug Krisner. You can join Brian Curtis and myself for the stories making news and moving markets in the APAC region. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcast and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business app. Chinese Premier Li Chung is in Australia. Let's take a closer look now with uh, Bloomberg's Paul Allen, our uh, TV Australia correspondent who joins us on the line from Canberra. Can you help me understand the aim of the visit here, Paul? Yeah, Doug, it's uh, really to get things back on track. And in fact, those are the exact words that the Chinese Premier Li Chiang used uh, when he arrived uh, first off in Adelaide uh, for this uh, four-day trip. He says uh, Australia is uniquely positioned to connect to east and west, uh, and there's going to be two new pandas on the way for Australia as well to replace the two that have been here for 15 years. So heavy on symbolism. And when you think where we were just a few years ago, I mean, it was only January that the tariffs on Australian wine got lifted. It was in 2021 that China was handing out a list of 14 demands or grievances, and yet here we are. Uh, a visit from uh, a Chinese premier, and it smiles and handshakes all around. When I think of Australia, and I think of how rich the country is in natural resources and the critical minerals that are linked to industries in China, is this going to be a, a key topic as well? Yeah, definitely. And there are still plenty of points of tension here, despite this reset. Uh, premier Lee will be heading to Western Australia next, where he'll visit uh, a lithium mine. Uh, and the critical minerals is a point of tension as well. Uh, Chinese investors were ordered to divest from a company here in Australia, a small company called Northern Minerals. Uh, that uh, provides rare earths, critical minerals, and that divestiture was ordered by the Australian government because it was uh, in national security interests. Uh, it's interesting, too, that China only accounts for 2% of foreign investment in Australia, about $85 billion dollars. Uh, the U.S., on the other hand, uh, directly invests more than a trillion U.S. dollars in Australia, uh, about a quarter. So even though China's the second largest economy in the world, Australia's largest trading partner, foreign investment lags far behind, and, and at the root of it are these national security issues. What about the, the security tension uh, between these two countries, particularly as it relates to uh, South China Sea? Yes, uh, the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, says that is something he's going to raise, and it's already been raised by the Foreign Minister as well. Uh, there, there have been a number of near misses between the Chinese and Australian military in that area over the past few months. Uh, most recently, last month, uh, Australia accused a Chinese jet of flying of uh, firing flares dangerously close to an Australian helicopter. Uh, China, of course, uh, disputes that, uh, but it is indicative that these tensions do remain. Uh, there is also the matter of uh, Yang Hengzhong, who is an Australian writer. He's facing a suspended death sentence in China right now. Uh, the Prime Minister says he intends to raise that to the Premier as well. When you look at the current state of uh, trade relations, I know we just kind of went from uh, economic issues to security issues, now back to economic issues. How has trade flow uh, been working out between uh, Australia and China lately? Well, it's interesting that the really key uh, trading commodity during these years of tensions uh, did not get affected. Iron ore continued to flow freely. Uh, China needs it. Uh, so the things that did suffer trade strikes, uh, barley, wine, uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, coal exports, some beef exports as well, uh, these were all fairly symbolic. Uh, but in terms of trade, as, as I mentioned, uh, China is Australia's number one trading partner, but Australia is China's number five trading partner. So there is a reasonable degree of, of equity in these trading positions, and uh, it's in the interest of both countries to make sure that this is, uh, that this is dealt with and relations normalized. Uh, there is still one trade strike left from China against Australia. That is live rock lobsters. Um, Premier Lee is heading to Western Australia next, as I said. That's where the rock lobster fisheries are. So there is an expectation that that's going to get lifted as well. 
and to be honest, it would be a bit weird if everything else got lifted and that one stayed in place. Uh, but that could be an announceable that we see in the next couple of days. When, when you consider the politics of Australia and uh, the mission of the Albanese government in addressing the relationships between, or the relationship singular between China and Australia, I, would you say that it's it's a pretty hawkish one? That's a curious question as well. Uh, look, just as an aside, I'm not sure if you can hear what's going on in the background here, but. Uh, I am sitting on the front lawn of Parliament House at the moment. There'd be a few hundred protesters uh, in front of me, uh, both pro-China, and also there are a lot of free Tibet flags in the uh, in the crowd as well, and a lot of Falun Gong flags. Um, you know, that that's uh, an indication of how more openly a protest is accepted here in Australia. And you know, all of these groups are Chinese nationals. But in terms of the political environment and the hawkishness, uh, something else interesting happened today. Um, Peter Dutton, who is the leader of the coalition, and the coalition was in power when the relations with China sank to a low. Uh, Peter Dutton is now the nation's preferred prime minister. He's taken the lead over Anthony Albanese for the first time. Uh, now, he and the coalition would have a more hawkish stance. Uh, the Premier Lee will be meeting Peter Dutton later on today. So that meeting's taken on an an interesting poignancy uh, that China could soon be dealing uh, with a, a more hawkish regime again. Mm, we'll have to wait and see on that. Sounds interesting. Yes, definitely. Paul, thank you so much for filling us in. Great reporting. Paul Allen, Bloomberg TV Australia correspondent, joining us uh, from Canberra. Let's bring in our guest, Ben Luke, is with us. Ben is Senior Multi-Asset Strategist at State Street Global Markets. He's joining us from our studios in Hong Kong. It's always a pleasure, Ben. Thanks for being with us. So what do you think is driving the situation more these days? Is it central bank policy or is it this enthusiasm around artificial intelligence? Well, I think in the near term, it remains to be inflation. Very simply, Doug. I think when you actually look at the post macro releases reaction functions you can see that the biggest impact in terms of markets remains to be whether or not inflation moves back into what we consider as a comfortable level for central banks and that leads to ultimately how rates are getting priced in and then that also will be the second impact to that would be how currencies would drive because of how rates are moving so right now i still think it's an inflation story as opposed to obviously earnings or ai or even the latest geopolitical tensions that we're seeing so if you look at the numbers that we had here in the u.s uh, last week both whole wholesale and retail inflation directionally we are moving in in the right way for the Fed to be able to cut rates. I mean, there are some people now that are saying in order for the Fed to be successful in engineering soft landing, that they should get to it and begin cutting interest rates. Do you think that the, the folks on that side of the, the debate have have a point? Yeah, I think so. I think in terms of the direction we are getting there, I think it's the pace of the movement that remains to be a struggle for the Fed to really pull the first trigger is what we think. Um, very simply, when we actually look at what the summary of economic projections are indicating, they're still expecting somewhere at around 2.8 or even somewhere around 3% in terms of year, year end targets. And the only way for you to get there is you need to basically have the same monthly reports that we're seeing like what we've seen last month, which is around 0.2% month over month. If you get that, then I think at least you get it for another three or four months out down the road, then it gives you that confidence that the Fed can start the cycle and not just cut it right into, um, um, or right, right, stop it immediately and actually can continue on with the path is what we hope to see. So when you think that way, I'm curious about the way that you're forecasting the behavior of the dollar going forward. The dollar has been remarkably resilient. Will it begin to fade a bit now as the Fed starts to shift policy? Or will the dollar, when you compare what's happening in other parts of the world, remain, remain in very solid shape? I think going into the second half, we have actually downgraded the conviction in the dollar. We had an overweight in the dollar throughout the first half of this year. 
we are finally moving back towards a neutral position. The reason for this is positioning is very extreme already. Um, as you mentioned, that everybody is owning the dollar right now. So it, there is obviously a much more limited room for appreciation when positioning is that high. The second thing is the dollar has actually rallied quite a bit, obviously, on rate differentials. And as we anticipate the Fed to cut rates following on with what we see for the rest of the G10 space, then there isn't that much of an uptick in terms of differentials that benefits the dollar and not the rest of the world. So that also comes into play. And last but not least, we continue to see it as a soft landing scenario, as you mentioned before. And that scenario tends to be beneficial for equities to rally still, and that, that, that should help to alleviate the stress from that dollar strength that we hopefully would see in the second half. So we have some central bank meetings to contend with in the week ahead. The PBOC is on the list along with the Bank of England and the Reserve Bank of Australia. Let's begin in China. The decision that we're expecting later today on the medium-term lending facility. Is China being as aggressive as the government ought to be under these circumstances? If, if you want to reach that growth target, is, is Beijing doing enough? It's simply not in, in, in our view. Um, there's still a sense in, in our view that the PBOC prioritizes currency stability over growth. I mean, when we look at liquidity injection numbers and when we actually look at how the daily fixing has moved and how the currency is valuated uh, when you actually compare the currency against its CFX basket, it's still overweight. If the PBOC is really committed to pushing on with further growth, they could actually let the currency weaken more. But in fact, they didn't. So I think the MLF cut is not something we expect in the near term yet because they still want to keep the currency stable for now, unfortunately. So does that mean that domestic demand will remain sluggish and <clears throat> that uh, China will be mired in, in somewhat of a deflationary trap? Unfortunately, I think that's still the case. Um, we run our own inflation metrics called Price Stats, which is an online inflationary metrics that we run, which is a daily basis. And we basically track p things online prices. And we still continue to see China being in this deflation territory, unfortunately. And I don't think this is going to change unless we see them actually give up or at least allow for more fluctuality when it comes to the currency going forward. At the end of last week, as you know, we had the meeting of the Bank of Japan. Policy rate was held steady. Not a surprise. I think the market was very eager to get some suggestion that there would be a reduction in bond purchases, but we didn't get anything along <laughs> those lines. I mean, yeah. we've been told now to wait until after the July meeting. Is that significant disappointment, do you think? And is it is it re a reflection of something that we should pay attention to in terms of the thinking at the BOJ? Well, I think the... It's still a very dovish take from the Bank of Japan. Um, we were expecting the same thing, no cut, no changes in the rates, obviously some sort of an announcement to come through in terms of the tapering. Our, our, our guess was they would actually start off with a very beginning tapering. I mean, right now, their, their goal is that they still reinvest around $6 billion monthly in terms of its JGB purchases. If you can cut it down by half or cut it down by a third at the very beginning, that can at least send a signal. But the signal from having no numbers to come up with the overall meeting indicates that they're still very, very hesitant to actually tighten. And that's why I think the dollar yen continues continues to strengthen at this level where they will actually go back up to 160 if they don't intervene again, unfortunately. Ben, very quickly, a Japanese CPI at the end of the week. Where do we stand right now with the inflation in Japan? As I mentioned, in terms of the price stats, we are actually seeing above trend inflation. So there is significant uh, evidence for them to actually taper. But the mindset, I think, of the Bank of Japan remains to be much more dovish than what markets are expecting. Ben, always a pleasure. Thanks for making time with us. Uh, ben Luke is the senior multi-asset strategist at State Street Global Markets, joining us uh, from our studios in Hong Kong here on Daybreak Asia. Let's get to our guest. Olivier Dossier is with us. Olivier is uh, head of applied research for the APAC at Sim Corporation. He joins us 
uh, from the Lion City of Singapore. Olivier, it's always a pleasure. A lot of the focus has been on the Fed, uh, stubborn in its uh, mission of getting inflation under control. But if you look at the data, the, the direction here seems clear. Um, right now, I think the Fed is looking for just one rate cut. Markets may be a little bit more aggressive in looking at 225 basis point rate cuts between now and and uh, the end of uh, 24. What is your expectation here is this in regards to the Fed? I think the Fed will have this this one time and, that, and that'll be it. Because if you look at the data, yes, inflation came down. Um, I mean, it, it was higher than expected for three months and it came down for the last two, but that's really because uh, April and May of 2023 were high numbers. So they were easy to beat. But uh, June, July, and August were very low numbers last year. So inflation has to stay extremely low for, for the uh, annual rate to, to, to remain on the downward path. And that may not be the case. All right. So can we conclude that maybe the Fed has been successful in, in engineering somewhat of a soft landing here? Whether the Fed was successful or whether it's just simply the economy that is slowing down, it's hard to tell at this point who's, who gets all the credit. But at least inflation is on the right path, but it might take a longer, you know, that, than people expect to get that last stretch. And really, if you, if you heard that the uh, consumers are complaining about inflation, the Fed's mandate is still to fight inflation because unemployment's doing okay. Mm-hmm. Are you still constructive on the American equity market? I think the equity market has gone up quite a lot already, and volatility is really, really low right now ahead of what usually is a calm summer, but this year is different, right? We expected out of the the 13 kind of events that are on the calendar for this summer, we expected the EU parliamentary elections to be one of the tamest events, and look what happened. Yeah. It's, it's sent shockwave through France, maybe Germany. We still have the UK elections next. We have, uh, of course, still the US uh, pre-election debates and then uh, and national conventions. We have the Olympics, we have UFO, we have so many events. Meanwhile, we still don't know how and when uh, wars in either Ukraine or, or Gaza will end. So there's quite a lot of uh, uh, risk out there that, that is not priced into markets. Well, you mentioned the situation in Europe, but we also have uh, the ECB cutting interest rates, obviously, although Madame Lagarde was uh, putting market on uh, the markets, plural, on notice not to expect much more. The ECB will be data driven, but all central bankers say that. When, when you look at what's happening on the continent, how is Europe doing? I think Europe uh, is back into, you know, 50-50, whether it has a double dip recession, and that's also one of the, the reasons why the ECB decided to cut. Um, and, and again, if we have a very uh, volatile summer, if all these events go uh, the wrong way, then we could have a situation where uh, the economy suffers from all of that uh, volatility and uncertainty. Right? We have too many elections that, that uh, could go to the far right, and we, we've never had these uh, these parties in power. We don't know what they will do uh, and how they will manage the economy. Yeah, I remember when we started the year, the uh, number of elections that were happening across the globe. I mean, it, it really spoke to the risk, the potential risk of, of that politics would play in, in performing or allowing the markets to perform this year. It's kind of... Uh, I guess, coming to uh, to manifest. When, when you look at the China story, we're expecting the monthly activity data later today. I mean, what's your read on China right now? Well, China, you know, has has some big issues, right? Uh, and the property market is still non-resolved. We, we keep hearing that a, a, a package, a rescue package is, in, is going to be put in place. The so market goes up for a little while, but then waits for details. Details don't come or details come short. And that's where we are right now. We had this big rally from mid-April to mid-May, uh, and then we pause, and now we were kind of losing hope a little bit. Uh, geopolitically, there's still a lot of tensions. U.S.-China is, is not going in the right direction. Uh, so, so there are a lot of uh, reasons to worry there. You, you seem a little bit cautious, and I'm wondering if, if a person were to be defensive in the current environment, how do you play that defensiveness? So there are, there are ways to play right now because markets are very concentrated. Well, we're talking about seven stocks in the U.S., 11 in Europe. There are uh, uh, other sectors to play, other other uh, areas to look at that have been ignored by by investors because they don't get the same hype as, as AI or or. Uh, 
uh, the Wigovi uh, uh, drugs. So I, I would I would really urge investors to look at some of the sectors in uh, consumer staples, some of the uh, banks, uh, not mid-sized banks, keep stick to the large banks, and some of the um, uh, energy companies, because all of this AI stuff is going to need a lot of energy, which we don't have right now. So we had the BOJ meeting at the end of last week and a lot of criticism from participants that perhaps uh, the BOJ is behind the cur curve at this point. It's not moving aggressively enough. Uh, we're going to get some indication as to the uh, amount of bond reduction, bond buying reduction, but not until the July uh, BOJ meeting. How are you viewing Japan these days? So Japan's benefited from you know, geopolitics, right? The rerouting of the global supply chain away from China. It's benefited from a weak yen, right? We were 122 years ago, we're 157, 158 today. That's a bit ridiculous. Uh, so it, it's had some, some positive uh, technical uh, or external factors, um, but inflation has been higher than what the BOJ says it wants for what, uh, 18, 19 months in a mm -hmm. row now, and they've done nothing. So we'd like to see them stop printing money a little bit and see if the economy can hold on on its own. Would you be a buyer very quickly of Japanese equities at these levels? At these levels, probably not. Uh, but uh, any dips would be nice to take. All right, we'll leave it there. Olivier, always a pleasure. Thanks for being with us. Olivier Dossier, Head of Applied Research for the APAC at Simcorp, joining us uh, from Singapore here on uh, Daybreak Asia. Let's take a look at market action with our guest, Louis Navalier. He is the founder and chairman of Navalier Associates. He joins us from the Sunshine State. Louis, pleasure to have you on the program. Thanks so much for joining us. Let's begin with the Fed. We've heard a little bit uh, from a number of Fed officials kind of pushing back on the eagerness that many in the market are uh, expressing with respect to rate cuts this year. How do you see the Fed engineering this process? Well, normally the Fed does cut before the election because they don't want to be part of the political debate. They'll be dragged into the election debate because they'll be blamed for some of the problems out there. Um, so obviously we have a rate cut coming in September. I frankly think we ought to cut in July. The only reason that we haven't cut yet is, um, is that owner's equivalent rent uh, issue in the CPI. Uh, the PPI, of course, was perfect the other day, you know. Um, so it, the inflation is out of the PPI. So, uh, you know, in America, we're still growing. We have household formation because of immigration and we have a higher birth rate. Um, but you go, you go someplace like Europe, they don't, they don't have household formation, so they don't have real estate inflation. So, you know, it's, um, you guys actually did a good job reporting on Friday that the PCE, uh, components look like the PC is going to be at point one or lower um so that that would give us hope um right now bad news is good news no one wants to see strong retail sales or strong pmis because we all just want the fed to hurry up and cut and the bond vig vigilantes the people that set the the bond market yields are actually probably more important than the fed right now so if growth is really not coming down in a meaningful way maybe we get a, a number of uh, data points that kind of put the markets at ease in terms of the inflation story, are you still positive on equities? Is growth enough to drive earnings going forward? Yeah, I don't have an earnings issue, but the market is shockingly narrow. Uh, you know, our, our research shows you got to be in the top 60% of uh, fundamentals. The market's very fundamentally focused. Uh, but unfortunately, the top 5% continue to hog all the money. You know, the NVIDIAs, the Super Micros, the Eli Lillies, Nova Nordis, things like that. And, um, but the market it did broaden out a bit in May on small cap. Uh, it's broadening out now because we have the annual Russell realignment. But, um, you know, I'd like to see more than just earnings drive the market. And I think the when the Fed starts to cut raise, rates, it gives a little turbo boost to the market. And our traditional pattern is we will rally right up to the election. You know, the election rhetoric is good. You know, uh, we went from having no taxes on tips to having no taxes because we're just going to, uh, have tariffs, you know, I mean, <laughs> I doubt if that will happen, but, <laughs> you know, it's interesting rhetoric, you know what I mean? And, and the other side's promising student loan relief, et cetera. So, 
um, you know, this is this is why we tend to rally going in elections. Well, you talked about the narrowness. I mean, a lot of leadership coming from mega cap tech, obviously. Will that be the story for the remainder of the year? There's no way to to kind of argue with that at this point. Well, um, again, I'm, I'm quoting Bloomberg uh, when I watch you guys. Uh, I think you guys said we went from the Magnificent Seven, the Magnificent One, and 40, 499 other stocks. And uh, I would respectfully agree with that since NVIDIA is my largest holding. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, Apple has to introduce a folding phone. Uh, Microsoft's okay. Uh, you know, Google's got some antitrust things. Uh, Meta's you know, uh, got margins under pressure. So I, 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 we are in a magnificent one right now, to be candid with you. And uh, we'd like to see the market broaden out from there. But uh, we will ra rally going into elections. Earnings are forecasted to be up. You have to have positive analyst revisions at this juncture, you know, because after earnings season winds down, the analysts that are revising their estimates higher are, um, are really helping those stocks. The other thing is we have a very strong dollar that mm. impedes multinationals. Mm -hmm. so I do think it will shift to more small mid cap um, uh, through June. You know, um, July is okay. I hate August. If I run the market, I just close every August. And um, but come come October, we'll be rallying again. And uh, so, uh, but we'll have some bumps along the way. So you mentioned the Nvidia story. Obviously, that is pretty much the centerpiece of the artificial intelligence trade. What would cause you to to reconsider that, at least in the short term? There's been so much euphoria around AI. I mean, are we at risk of maybe some type of corrective behavior when it comes to price action? No. Uh, I wrote an article that NVIDIA would be a four trillion uh, uh, billion dollar, a four trillion uh, dollar company uh, this year and five trillion dollars next year. Um, I'm, I'm dead serious about that. Uh, this company uh, went nuts last quarter before its black world chips were, were being shipped. Now the black world chips are being shipped every year. They got new chips. Uh, the chips take over $2 billion uh, to develop. Uh, they'll be introducing new chips every every year until the end of the decade. And then eventually um, we'll have to go to quantum computing to speed things up because the, the chips are approaching the atomic level. Mm. You know, we, we don't know how to how to go go uh, smaller than that. So um, uh, Nvidia will also have an appliance sized computer. It'll be water cooled that will replace entire data centers. So my biggest bets right now are in the data center uh, uh, companies that are helping uh, boost cloud, cloud computing, boost the electric grid. Um, we have a lot of cybersecurity stocks as well. We do have a grid issue because uh, the Biden administration um, did um, uh, rush recently uh, a mandate that uh, they have to sequester the carbon on big natural gas plants. And uh, a, 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 a carbon sequester uh, approval is like eight years. OK, so that's really screwed up um, expanding the grid. And, you know, obviously it depends where you live, but. You know, obviously California, Nevada or solar and batteries and other places would just like put in more natural gas speaker power plants to, to meet a low demand. So we do have a very acute electricity problem brewing in America. Louis, uh, always a pleasure. Louis Navalier, a founder and chairman of Navalier Associates, joining us here on Daybreak Asia. This has been the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast, bringing you the stories making news and moving markets in the Asia Pacific. Visit the Bloomberg podcast channel on YouTube to get more episodes of this and other shows from Bloomberg. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen, and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.